Welcome back to The Great Conversation. We are in the second book of Herodotus. On the death of Cyrus, his son takes his empire, and he is on his expedition against Egypt now. And in paragraph two, Herodotus then says, now the Egyptians before the reign of their king believe themselves to be the most ancient of mankind. And then it gets kind of confusing because then it's these two children and there's a goat herd. What's happening? And I actually have um, a paper here written by Rachel Wong. And it says, the beginning of Herodotus II is marked by a lively account of a linguistic experiment involving two children raised among goats, a goat herd, and an Egyptian king inquiring after the origin of mankind. The king, the Egyptian king, asks the goat herd goat herd to report the first word that the children utter. And when it turns out that the word is a Phrygian word for bread, the Egyptians reluctantly see that the Phrygians are the race from which all others have descended. And here it's the question is, was Herodotus just writing down what the stories that he heard? Did he actually believe that this was history? Hmm. Was there conjecture in his recording? what's happening. And I don't know what I believe about it yet because think, I'm still learning so much. Yeah. I think the weird thing is like that he would have the gall and the assumption to think that those two were the races of all the world and all the beginnings. Right. I think that was probably his first poor inquiry was like not considering that there's other races all around the world and no, 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 you know, saying that he's wrong for what he knew in that time. I think that's where I go. Right. So, I mean, obviously, and he, he lays this out later in paragraphs, the Egyptians were a very old race, thousands of years before even Herodotus lived. There was, yes. there was plenty of proof of that. And the question is, you know, what was the cradle of civilization? Where did people come from? Who exactly. did have the oldest forms of language or writing and and where were the other languages derived from and and where did the phrygian people originally come from and then you know there was a lot of migration of people happening at this time yeah and so yeah i think it was it was definitely something that he was trying to record in a way that maybe he believed it was actually true not just tales of old but yeah trying to actually record something that that could be used as proof for for a history book. Yeah, it was a very, very odd way to prove it out because when you think about it, like you don't speak anything to these children and all of a sudden, like where did they hear this word? Like, did they make up the word? Like it was just, it was very, it was a very odd way to conduct an experiment, but they didn't have any sort of blood tests or anything like that, you know, in, the, in, those, in those days. So it does seem like the most logical form of the experiment, but it was just very odd. Well, it was a story that he had been told by, yeah. by someone. And I mean, yeah. that's, that is what Herodotus is doing. He's traveling around taking these stories from the people that would have been passed down from antiquity. Yeah, he's collecting it all, putting it all together so we have some And hopefully trying maybe not to give his opinion, but obviously his political opinion of the time and, and what he knew would have played a role in that. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, so the question was, where did language originate from? The Egyptians or the Phrygians? And, and in this, the Egyptians said okay find the phrygians <laughs> they they it came from them which is so interesting because in uh modern day history as we learn it in school i'd never heard of the phrygians had you i think they're i mean yeah i remember like hearing the name briefly talked about but again but the egyptians take the crown as far as the amount of history that we are taught absolutely yeah yeah so from our standpoint the egyptians would in fact be one of the older or oldest ancient races yeah. from what we have now learned yeah. To this point. Yeah. And he was trying to solve that in his time. Yeah. And and even from there, Herodotus goes on to talk about everything that the Greeks had that could have come from the Egyptians of the time. So he yeah. mentions the solar year, the 12 parts yes. from the stars. That was from the Egyptians and, and plus those five extra days, which now we use the 12 months of the year and we just add, you know, a day 30 every to 31. other month. Yeah, absolutely. So that's really cool. That was, you know, a little fact that most people probably don't know yeah you know found in herodotus and then also the 12 gods from the egyptians to the greeks yeah and that's where that was the part where herodotus really got it, it became very interesting about the gods and and where did the gods come from and and he mentions homer briefly and hesoid 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 hesiod hesiod yeah hesiod. and 
saying that the personalities, the traits, the characterization of the gods coming from them. But again, Homer was recording tales of old. Yeah. So right? he was like we Epic learned tales. in Epic when we read Homer, poems. he was taking the narrative that had been passed down from word of mouth and putting it into the pages of history. Right. So again, where did where did those come from? Yes. If antiquity, would they have come from the Egyptians? Yeah, for sure. Because like he said, there was a lot of trading back and forth between the Greeks and the Egyptians with respect to the gods. Did, did they get this idea about the gods from the Greeks or did the Egyptians have the, the homeland turf on who decided what it was going to be first? Yeah. Yeah. So very interesting. If you're reading along with us in Herodotus, let us know what you thought about what what Herodotus was saying about those gods. If, if he agreed with with the fact that they had just been written down by Homer or were the gods actually true, they weren't created. Hmm. It was very it was very interesting conversation about that. Yeah, and it was a really kind of a short a short paragraph. Right. But then he talked a lot about all the different gods in the different cities, dwellings. He talked a lot about the women priestess, which was very rare. Most usually it was men. So Dodona do, Dodona, yeah, was where the women were priestess. And there was like three or four of them there, but normally men would have been the priests. And so it was interesting how he kind of perused through the different cultures and the different things that he found. Yeah, Egypt is very different from the Greeks. Yeah. And I like that he was recording that about the way that they practice everyday life. Their cleanliness. Yeah, their cleanliness, commerce. The women are the ones that go out and do the trading. The men stay at home at the, on the loom. And they sew. Yeah, as you're doing, that's funny. That was not planned. I know. Fixing your pants there. Yep. Yeah, it was really cool just how briefly he went through everyday life, but then he spent such... So we're in paragraphs 1 through 62 this yeah. week. That's yep. what we're talking about. And he spent a very long time, which he, I'm guessing, thought was very brief, on the Nile. And, yeah, and where does the Nile... Where is its source? And he gave different ideas of the source. Some of them he said, I don't believe that could even be. Like snow on the mountains there well, could be snow here and and now actually herodotus was wrong there could be snow there yeah absolutely and i think more than anything he was trying to gain a understanding of why the nile overflows that was the right where biggest, is the source coming from yeah that's providing all of this water to the nile that is then overflowing yes how far uh, I think 40 miles. <laughs> yeah. You thought 30. I thought 30 miles. Overflowing maybe yeah. 30 miles. Because he talked about two days journey is how far it actually overflows. But then we started talking like, okay, does that mean everybody's houses are flooded or do they build such good irrigation yeah. that their houses were built up and then the, the water flowed around them? Um, it, it's very like how, how to live with that being a yearly occurrence would take a lot of infrastructure and planning, which the Egyptians are very much known for. Mm -hmm. I mean, as, we, as we've seen in excavations of ancient Egypt, their ability to create systems to cope with their circumstances and the weather and life was just incredible. It was like nothing that had ever been seen. So that's where we are right now in yeah. Herodotus. Yeah, if you're still trying to figure a lot out. Yeah, if you're, I mean, I was kind of annoyed because I was like, just give us a map because he went on Which this. He did. Here's well, a map. Yeah, there's a map, but he went on this whole escapade of like talking about like the furlongs and the scones or, or scones, like these distances. <laughs> and I was like, bro, just give us a map and write down the, the distances. Because it was just like, I, I'm a little bit struggling as, as I'm not sure if some of you are. This was a hard, you know, hard amount of reading for me it just felt like just over and over just explaining all these distances and i was i'm more of somebody who likes pithy quotes and it was just a lot of talking about things that weren't really interesting so i am kind of struggling though i'm excited about this journey if you're struggling too i'm in there with you i, I feel you um and you of course have encouraged me so thank you for that and I hope that we can encourage you in your journey to keep going because sometimes we're going to find sections of the great books, uh, even though we're only in the third book, uh, third, you know, set, uh, that, are, that are more challenging than others. But I think what we're doing is we're building our foundation. Every book is a foundational piece. So that way when something's referenced back or we have a better understanding of the whole, uh, we'll be able to, to really have a great foundation about these works. What are you going to say about this, Matt? No, the map I think is super helpful just because, like you were saying, he is very detailed. 
which is incredibly important, especially for it is. for archaeologists today. For for you and I, it definitely does seem tedious. All these little measurements, yeah. But it is what also helped him create his map. And true, the map that he created for Africa is super important because where Libya is and Egypt and the Ethiopians is very different from our current. Well, it's it's different, not very different from yeah. the current way that Africa is right now. Um, so definitely reference Herodotus's map so that you understand what he's saying. Because if you're looking at a current day map, it's not going to make as much sense. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you that, that don't know what we're in, we're in the Britannica with the 1992 version. And I always include full uh, biography and description of where we're at in the book, what book we're reading. So you can kind of reference that so you know what map and what page are you on. The map? Yeah. It's just at the end. So it's at the end of the book. So yeah. it's like three. It's after the index. So it's, there's an index. So it's past like 314. Okay. So it's back there in the back of the book. Or maybe it's before the index. Yeah, it's before yeah, the so index. So right before Sorry. the index. So yeah, this um this has been something that we, you know, we joked earlier in the day yesterday, and she's and Hannibal says, Hey, if we just make it through Herodotus this year, uh, we will have accomplished something. Because it's it's a lot of reading. We're we're busy. And uh, it's been it's been challenging. But I think that's how our culture is so much of the time. It's when when you decide you're going to do something, if you want to be somebody who's reading the great books, it's embarrassing mm. to think that you're reading so little. And, and you say you're reading the great books. And if somebody says to you, oh, what about did you like, you know, whatever this this section of a book? And you're like, oh, I'm not there yet. I'm still in Herodotus. I've been in Herodotus all year or whatever. Yeah, that. That can feel so defeating and then you think, okay, I'm just not going to do it all because yeah. I don't want to be that yeah. person. But to then zoom out and say, if we read Herodotus this year, if that's all that we did, you know, yeah. we're, you and I are reading other books. We have a lot of other projects going on. This is one section of our life. We're not giving our all in all to this. We're, we're giving a section of our life to this. Yeah. But then in the grand scheme of things to say, Hey, we read Herodotus last year. Yeah. And next year, maybe, you know, we'll get on to the next one. And we're probably going to read it faster than this year. But if that were the only thing to happen, who do you know who's read, who's read all of Herodotus? That's probably true. nobody, you know, in your circle, maybe in your circle. No, not in my circle. <laughs> not in your circle. So to say, I read Herodotus. And when you're in the midst of it, it feels so daunting daunting and yeah. it feels like you're not really doing anything but one day we will get to say we'll we read that. all of it yeah and, we've read and it great will be in our books. repertoire yeah and we will not remember a lot of it hmm. but we can go back and reference things and hopefully get an o another opportunity to read it again with more perspective and more understanding yes yeah i will agree with that because i've had we've had people come over to our house and they'll walk up to the great books we have them kind of in our, our reading dining room area and they'll walk up and they'll find an author that they have read or they resonate with. And they will beeline towards that author to create some sort of validation for themselves. Forgive me. I'm not making fun of them. But I, what I'm saying is this can yeah. invoke the feeling of, of being inadequate in the great books. Because they'll walk up and they'll go, oh, I love uh, – uh, oh, that's so – I love Machiavellian, right? Yeah. And I'll be like, okay, cool. I haven't read it. And right there, you feel like inadequate. Even though least, we're reading the Even great though books. we're reading the, all of the great books, I didn't know that one that they've read. And now I feel like a, a loser because I've got all these books ahead of me and I can't even, I can't even say anything about their favorite one. But mm -hmm. then if you think about it, maybe they read a poll quote one time that they resonated maybe. with. Maybe. Maybe. But I'm just saying what, what I'm saying is like our, our goal is to get through the, the breadth of it slowly, intentionally, and one day at a time. Yeah. And that is the aim – and that's ought to what that is what's ought to keep us going. Because I'm doing it for times. me. Yes. I am reading these for myself. Yeah. Not so you can go tell somebody a quote or not so you can go tell somebody that you've read them, but so you can have the liberal education that you yourself owe yourself, I think. Or I owe myself. So <laughs> anyway, just you know, being honest, being raw, like it's been challenging for me for sure. And uh, but I'm excited again to read more next week and, and come back in the next episode. See y'all next time. <laughs>